then it's all good. All right. Thanks a lot, Russell. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at the ANU. And my current project, I'm working with the Department of Health and Aged Care under a project that's called the Healthy Minds, Healthy Bodies. So today, what I'll be talking about is the research under that project, um, which is the mortality analysis of mental health cohorts with comorbid physical conditions in Australia. Okay, so in terms of the agenda, I'll first go through the context, then also just go through briefly some similarities of the Healthy Minds, Healthy Bodies project with a similar project that we're aware of by Equally Well as well. And then lastly, the preliminary results that we're seeing for the life expectancy gaps to date. Okay, so in terms of um, context, improving the physical health and life expectancy for people living with mental health co conditions is a focus area for two government arrangements one being the National Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Agreement and the other being the fifth National Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Plan. So what we hope to do under the analysis for the Healthy Minds, Healthy Bodies project is essentially to contribute to the evidence base for these two government arrangements. So the work to date that has been done has been focused on the first objective of the Healthy Minds, Healthy Bodies project and that is trying to answer the question, what are the health and social outcomes of individuals that have comorbid mental and physical health issues for different diagnosis groups compared to those without such conditions? Now, in order to get a better understanding of the health and social outcomes, one of the first aims of the study is to look at quantifying the life expectancy gap of individuals in Australia as well as the factors including their physical comorbidities. The other is then identifying the risk factors for these cohorts. So that might include factors such as smoking, diet, physical activity or alcohol consumption. And then lastly, we also hope to identify preventable hospitalisations and hospital readmissions for both mental and physical health issues. Now, we are still in the early days, so what I'll be going through in terms of our preliminary results is really focused on the first part, which is looking at the quantifying the life expectancy gap and everything around the excess mortality that we're seeing. Okay, so in terms of the comparison between the Healthy Minds, Healthy Bodies project and a similar Equally Well project, we know that there's also one going on at the moment. Um, both are aligned to the two government arrangements that I've mentioned already. Um, they are similar in terms of the type of analysis. So we're both looking at the life expectancy and life expectancy gap and risk factor analysis, which is really great because we can make sure that we're aligned in terms of the findings that we're getting on a national basis. Um, but what we're hoping to do for the Healthy Minds, Healthy Bodies project is to extend it and hopefully eventually look at the excess mortality experience by different um, mental health cohorts or different diagnosis groups. Um, now, in comparison, the equally well analysis really is on an aggregate basis, but what's really good about the equally well project that's going on at the moment is that it's able to do a time series analysis to what was done by the ABS um, in 2017 on 2011 experience. Okay, so in terms of the data that we're looking at, um, we have two large linked data sets. One is AIHW's National Integrated Health Services Information Analysis Asset, so that's NISI AA, and the other is ABS's uh, Multi-Agency Data Integration Project, so that's MADAP. Um, in terms of the timeline, so for NISI AA, the data that we have at the moment is a little bit older, but we're waiting for a refresh. It ranges between July 2010 to June 2017 and includes hospitalisation, Medicare benefit schedule, pharmaceutical benefit scheme, residential aged care and the National Death Index data. For matter, we have similar da data, so we have MBS, PBS, National Death Index, but we also have census and demographics data, migration, survey data that includes the National Health Survey and survey of disability, aging and carers and income and taxation data. 
So in terms of the data sets, the ones that are highlighted in teal, those are unique across the two. Um, and so what we see is if we're doing a mortality analysis, it's quite important to get the exposure right. And so we're focusing on using NISI AA first because the advantage of that is we can use the hospitalisation data. But as we move towards analysis on risk factors and so forth, we see the second data set MADAP to be very good in supplementing that information because we will get more information on the demographics, migration, the survey data, um, and income and taxation and so forth. Okay, so those are the two data sets that we're focusing on. Okay, so in terms of methods, um, we're um, proposing a population-based cohort study. At the moment, it's split into two cohorts, one that we've defined as a broad mental health cohort, so that has a wider spectrum of mental health conditions, and the other we're defining as a severe mental illness cohort. We do plan on then moving on to further segmentations by diagnosis groups later on. So in terms of the metrics, we're proposing a harmonised panel of mortality metrics. This was a call by um, earlier Denmark researchers that published in the Lancet that said that there is a need for, I guess, consistent metrics to allow for comparisons and within nations as, also, as well as by groups. So we are continuing with that harmonised panel of mortality metrics those being the mortality rate ratio, the life expectancy metric, as well as the life is lost metric. And then we also propose to add one additional metric, which is the health expectancy metric. So I'll go through all of them in terms of the advantages and disadvantages. So the mortality rate ratio metric, as all of you probably know, is a very um, popular metric um, and it's used in pretty much most of the studies on mortality. Um, the disadvantage of this is it is a relative risk measure. So when we say someone is three times more likely to die than someone else, what exactly does that mean, right? When everyone's going to die eventually anyway. Um, so whilst it's a comparison of mortality experience, um, there is that disadvantage of being um, not easily understandable by policymakers or the general public in, um, in general. Then we move on to life expectancy and the life expectancy gap metric. Now this is more easily understandable. If we say females are five years, um, on average live five years longer than males, um, that's an absolute risk measure that's probably more understandable by policymakers as well as the general Australian population. But the disadvantage when we apply it to the mental health cohort is that it doesn't take into account age of onset. So if we look at previous research that has looked at this metric, which is around the 2010, 2015 um, kind of time frame, they tended to use the life expectancy metric, but what they had to do was make an underlying assumption that everyone in the mental health cohort had an age of onset of 15. Now clearly that's a limitation because not everyone has an age of onset of 15. Um, in fact, what's been suggested is that's often led to an overestimation of the life expectancy gap. So then we move on to the life years lost metric. Now this is a more novel approach, which does now take into account the age of, uh, age of onset of the mental health condition. Now because we're moving on to dealing with age of onset, um, our definition, therefore, is we need to make an underlying assumption that everyone in this cohort has an enduring mental health condition. So in our case, we're only looking at the severe mental illness cohort for this analysis. Now, what we're essentially doing is we're following someone who is born. We look at um, if they're identified as being part of the severe mental illness cohort, what their age of onset might be. So that might be age 15, for example. And then we estimate their future life expectancy. From there, we compare to the general Australian population who was not part of the severe mental illness cohort. Again, go to age 15, estimate their life expectancy, take the difference. That is what we call the excess life is lost. Now that's for only one age of onset, so age 15, but we can do that for every age of onset from zero to say 95. 
So from there, we then take the age of onset distribution and then weight that to get one single metric, which is what we call the weighted average excess life years lost. And then that takes into account the whole, um, all the ages of onset, which is, a di uh, which is an advantage of this method compared to the life expectancy metric. And it's also still an absolute risk measure. And then lastly, health expectancy, we've added this in because all the other metrics are all about the quantity of life. We do also see it's important when we're looking at this cohort to also understand the quality of life. And so that part, we're trying to add that perspective here in this study. Okay, so in terms of our preliminary results, for our mortality rate ratio, what we're seeing is for the broad mental health cohort, they are, um, expect, they are 1.6 times more likely to die than the general population. And we also have split this by female and males. When we move on to the severe mental illness cohort, what we are seeing here is they are 3.9 times more likely to die than the general population. And again, we have um, the split by females and males here as well. Okay, this next slide here is on the age-specific mortality rates. So if you look at the graph on the right, what we have is we have the splits by the cohorts. The solid lines, blue and red, are for the severe mental illness cohort split by gender. The larger dotted lines are the age-specific mortality rates for the broad mental health cohort, again split by gender. And then the smaller dotted line is the general Australian population, again split by gender. So what we essentially see here is for every age, um, we're actually seeing that the severe mental illness cohort has a higher mortality, mortality rate at all ages compared to the broad mental health cohort. And then when we compare the broad mental health cohort at every age, they also have a higher mortality rate experience compared to the general Australian population. Okay, if we then move on to the life expectancy and life expectancy gap table, how you should interpret this table is if we look at the ages, um, the way you should read it is what is the life expectancy and therefore the life expectancy gap if we assumed that everyone in that particular cohort had an age of onset of whatever. So I've only taken out some. So if they all had an age of onset of 0, 15, 45, 65 or 85 plus. And I also have it by males and females. So if we just focus on age 15, for example, which is what would um, be the results in the research papers in 2010 to 2015, um, what we are finding is for males, um, they have a 9.4 year life expectancy gap um, for the broad mental health cohort compared to the general population. Um, and what we're seeing for females is they have a 7.5 year life expectancy gap compared to the general population. If we move on to the severe mental illness cohort, where we're, what we're seeing is males have a 20 year um, life expectancy gap compared to the general population um, and for females it's 19.3 years compared to the general population. Now this is broadly consistent with what we're seeing in those previous studies and also on other national studies as well. Um, now what's I guess for now what's also interesting to note is in all the cohorts the general Australian population, the broad mental health cohort and the severe mental illness cohort females still are expected to live longer than males. Okay, so that's just some, um, something to note there. Okay, so for this next graph, this is on health expectancy. So this graph shows the proportion of remaining life spent in the disease state, whether it's the broad mental health state or the severe mental illness state at each age. So if we look at the dotted lines again, um, and we look at the red line, this is for females and it's saying the proportion of remaining life spent in the broad mental health state at each age. So females are expected to spend 27% of their remaining life at age zero in the broad mental health state. And this is predicted to increase to 44% past age 80. For males, they are expected to spend 19% 
of their remaining life in the broad mental health state at age zero, and that's expected to increase to 31% past age 80. If we then move on to the severe mental illness cohort, what we are seeing is for females, they are expected to spend close to 0% of their remaining life in the severe mental illness state, um, which is severe mental illness state at age zero. And then that's expected to increase to 7% past age 80. Um, for males, what we have is they're expected to spend close to 0% um, of their remaining life in the severe mental illness state at um, age zero, and that's expected to increase to 5% past age 80. So what's interesting here is we're seeing that females are expected to spend a greater proportion of their remaining life in whichever the um, broad mental health state or the severe mental illness state. But if you remember from the previous slide, um, which I can't seem to go back. But if you remember from the previous slide, um, females generally have a longer life expectancy. So they are spending more of their life in this disease state. So this is kind of more an indication of the quality of life. Okay, so the next one here is on the life is lost. These two graphs here are on the survival curves of someone who is age 15 in the severe mental illness cohort. So that's the graphs on the left and then um, someone who's age 45 in the severe mental illness cohort, that those are the graphs on the right. So this survival curve, normally if we're looking at life expectancy, that's the white area um, underneath the survival curve. When we look at life is lost, it becomes the area on the top, which is the purple plus the green area added together. So for the life is lost, what we're seeing, for someone who is in the severe mental illness cohort at age 15, they're expected to have more of their life is lost contributed by external causes of death um, than compared to someone who's age 45, which I guess is not surprising. If we look at the breakdown, what we're seeing is those external causes of death are primarily intentional self-harm and accidents. But we, what we also see, though, is in terms of the greatest um, primary causes of death, they are still the physical um, conditions. So that includes the yellow, line, uh, yellow area, which is neoplasms, followed by circulatory system diseases, so that's the bottom teal colour. And then the third largest would be the um, nervous system diseases. So this is only on life years lost. We then move on to excess life years loss, which is when we compare it to the general Australian population. So the graph at the top here is when we compare to the general population, I've taken again some of the ages, so age 15 onset, 25, 45, 65 and 85. And what we can see is for the excess life years lost, we're seeing um, a greater proportion from the external causes at the younger ages, but that tapers off as we move to the older ages. Now, in terms of then the breakdown, um, the graph on the right has the more specific primary causes of death. And you can see, again, um, it, for the excess life is lost, for the external causes of de death, they're essentially intentional self-harm and accidents. But the largest one here is still neo neoplasms. You can see that in the large blue line. OK, so after we've done that, then we've got an um, age of onset as well and we can weight that. So we weight all of these findings into one single number. And what we're finding is a total um, average excess life years lost of the severe mental illness cohort to be 12.06 years. And that can be split into 10.1 years internal causes and 1.95 years external causes. Okay, and um, again, for the table on the right, that's just a more granular split. And so the greatest contributor is very much a physical condition, which is neoplasms of 6.24 years. Now, you might be wondering why there are so many other numbers. This is really just a sensitivity test. So our age of onset distribution is dependent on our follow-up period. So we've just changed our follow-up periods by a little bit just to see how different our age of onset distribution does become. And the good thing is it doesn't change very much. It's not actually a um, very variable um, number. So that's a good result. 
Okay, so those are our pre um, preliminary results that we're seeing. Okay, so just because I'm running out of time, um, in summary, this is essentially just saying that our results are quite consistent with other national studies. And in terms of future work, we do plan to split by um, different diagnosis groups. We are also still searching for the most accurate and practical excess mortality measures. And we still plan on doing the risk factor analysis, which will give us more insight into the association between mental health conditions and physical health conditions, as well as risk stratification tools to help inform preventable hospitalizations and hospital readmissions. Okay, so that's basically it. Um, I guess I'll open up to any questions now. Yep. Um, we've got just time just for one question. Uh, Scott. Um, thanks. Um, great presentation. Explains well the complexity of the question you're trying to answer in terms of the database. Just and I'm just curious how are you differentiating the two groups for yep. Yeah, that's a really good question. So at the moment, what we're doing for the broad mental health cohort is we're taking the same definition as AI, HW's mental health cohort, which is just you, anyone who is using mental health services um, under that can be captured in MBS, anyone who's taking mental health related drugs in PBS, and anyone who has a um, disorder from F00 to F90 as a primary um, diagnosis code in hospitalizations. So those are, that's the broad, that's capturing everyone. When we move on to the severe mental illness cohort, what we're trying to capture are the people who are bipolar, schizophrenia, and we also recognize we should also include severe depression and severe anxiety, but that's still a work in progress. For severe, um, for bipolar and schizophrenia, we use those diagnosis co codes in hospitalisation. And then for MBS and PBS, we've relied on mental health experts to give us a rule-based definition um, using certain medicines as well as seeing psychi psychiatrists how often. So that's probably like once every quarter, though, that kind of definition to get the severe mental illness cohort. But it is still a work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a fascinating project and, and the, the wealth of that data linkage is really the envy of the world. There's very few other countries that have got that capacity to bring data from so many sources. So great opportunity to policy and practice in Australia and internationally. So can we please thank Meg? Thank you.